Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, about two minutes or two ahead of schedule, but that gives a bit more flexibility at the end. So I'd like to introduce uh, many, Melanie Langer, who's going to be talking about exploring RSC identities. Take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Melanie. Um, everyone can hear me? All right. So I'm part of the STRIDE grant studying uh, socio-technical resilience in software development. Our goal is to recenter people within the field of software engineering. Um, and in particular to understand what kinds of practices can promote resilience within software development. Um, so today I'll be presenting results, and I am, I am by, uh, by training and by trade a psychologist. Um, so these will be the results of a survey that we've done um, with RSEs, both that's been developed with the health uh, and collaboration of RSE partners and also with RSE participants uh, answering our questions. So. Um, among some other findings, I'll be talking about uh, the extent to which people doing RSE work tend to identify as RSEs, um, as opposed to the extent to which they identify with their additional discipline, um, as well as their some key attitudes. Um, and these are attitudes that we have been told are key by our RSE partners. Um, uh, we'll also be talking about the degree to which RSEs experience having autonomy in the work that they do, some particularly relevant professional outcomes, um, as well as some psychological processes that are used to uh, manage obstacles and threat in RSEs' working lives um, and that contribute to the resilience of RSEs. Um, so a key concept for this talk will be social identification. Social identity is a, a key construct in social psychology uh, that refers to an individual's group memberships um, that shape their everyday interactions. Um, these have far-reaching implications in a wide variety of fields. Um, and these social identities can include professional identities. Um, individuals can have uh, multiple social identities, um, including multiple professional identities. And findings show that uh, the more social identities one has, actually the more positive um, are the effects, uh, including increasing resilience. Uh, so the RSE identity is a particularly interesting one to us because while it is becoming established to some extent, it is still a new one. And as, been, as has been already talked about at length today, um, it has a particularly interesting uh, position with regard to other identities and other professional identities that one might hold or um, encounter. Um, and as I've mentioned, uh, we had uh, a lot of involvement of RSEs in preparing the survey, obviously participating in the survey, and I hope in getting feedback uh, to today, today's presentation. So the first thing to note is that we do seem to have found our target population. We got a great response of, uh, from 381 participants um, from RSC, from individuals doing RSE work across disciplines. Um, all of the findings that I'll present today, all the means that you're going to see are out of a seven point Likert scale um, with, five, uh, with seven representing the high end and one representing the low end. Um, and I'll be presenting items today that we use to assess all the constructs I'll be talking about so you have a, an idea of what they refer to. So here, um, in order to make sure that we had actually found RSEs, we asked about um, the kind of work that they were involved in. Um, and so we had a mean here of over five out of seven um, for engagement in RSE work, making us feel pretty confident that we had in fact found people doing RSE work. Um, so to go over the demographics, uh, quickly we had about 50% uh, of our respondents uh, who were men. Um, the mean age was around 38 years old. Um, and we had uh, respondents with a variety of racial or ethnic backgrounds as well as from different countries, but a majority at 39% of white or European respondents um, and a majority of 77% uh, of respondents from the UK. Um, our, the, the mean number of years that our respondents had been engaging in RSE work or specifically writing software was about nine years. Uh, the majority had a master's at 37% or a PhD, 31%. Um, and there was more of a spread here, but the highest proportion of RSEs, 34%, uh, were earning between 40 and 50,000 pounds a year. Um, we found that while a very small percentage, just 1% um, of our respondents claimed no additional discipline, so uh, 
only reported being RSE, so it was only four out of our 381 respondents, we found that fully 77% of respondents claimed the RSE identity, so really a, a high majority of, of people who responded to the survey. Um, and we measured RSE social identity in a variety of ways, uh, as well as um, participants' alternative uh, professional social identity. So we had a single item measure just asking the degree to which they identified as an RSE versus their additional discipline, which they had previously told us uh, in the survey. Um, and we also asked about two components of social identity. Um, so you can see here that breaks down into uh, self-investment and self-definition. And we found equal levels of identification as an RSE, as level of identification with the additional uh, or all our alternative discipline. The only significant difference we found here was between self-investment in the RSE identity versus self-investment in the additional identity. And self-investment refers to um, the level of uh, solidarity, satisfaction with, and centrality of that identity. So people are feeling a little more self-investment, it appears, still with their um, additional professional identity. Uh, we found in terms of so the environments in which people are working um, that most, uh, the highest number um, have as their primary job title, software engineer or manager, although as you can see, there was a wide variety of other job titles that individuals reported having and they were um, allowed to enter that themselves here and then I went through and um, condensed them down to avoid repetition. Um, we also found that uh, a majority worked in either industry or at a university, although some, a good number also worked at a not government or in a nonprofit setting. Um, and that the majority worked in a non-grant funded lab group, 43%, um, with many others also working either in a grant funded lab group uh, or on an open source project primarily. Uh, so now I'll move on to some of the concerns that we surveyed and we focused on attitudes towards automation as well as use of automation and concern about error reduction and de-skilling as these were some of the top concerns pointed out to us by our RSE colleagues. Um, and we found that, again, this is on a, a seven point scale, so that attitude, attitudes towards automation were quite positive uh, as well as uh, use of automation being quite frequent. Um, and we found that levels of concern uh, were pretty high about both error reduction and de-skilling, but that the level of concern about error reduction was significantly higher than the level of concern about de-skilling for the RSEs who responded to our survey. Um, in, we found largely what we expected here with a few things that, that we didn't expect. So we found that greater concern about error reduction predicted more positive attitudes towards and more use of automation. We also found specifically that greater belief that automation, uh, sorry, that should say reduces errors, not reduces error reduction. Um, it's greater belief that automation reduces errors led to more positive attitudes towards and more use of automation, so that was as expected. However, we also found that greater concern about de-skilling um, predicted more positive attitudes towards and more use of automation. And as expected, we found that greater belief that automation increases de-skilling led to less positive attitudes about automation, but more use of automation. So I'd love to hear feedback from the group at the end of the talk. We think maybe what's going on there is that this uh, direction of causality perhaps goes the other way, where the more people are using automation, the more concerns they are about de-skilling. Um, so maybe you can shed some light on that. Um, I'll now go over some of our findings with relation to autonomy. So here you see three different forms of autonomy. Um, and we found that uh, the, our respondents had a fairly high level of autonomy and that these different forms of autonomy did not differ. Um, so RSEs appear to be enjoying a relatively high level of all three forms of autonomy. Um, and we found that, and this will be a pattern uh, that you'll see in the rest of the findings as well, that greater identification as an RSC predicted um, higher level of autonomy across all three types and in the aggregate. In terms of professional outcomes, we found again that they were fairly high, um, although we found a significant difference where RSEs uh, felt that they had a higher level of success and a higher level of meaningfulness in their work relative to uh, a lower level, a significantly lower level of satisfaction, um, at least re as reflected in terms of salary and promotion concerns. Um, and once again, we found that 
identifying more as an RSC predicted more positive professional outcomes uh, across outcomes and in the aggregate. And here uh, we included as well um, the, the quality of team communication within those primary work teams. Uh, so just uh, more, more evidence of the importance of having this identity. Um, and finally, I'll go over some findings on uh, the processes, the psychological processes that uh, our respondents use for managing obstacles and threat in their work um, and that contribute to their resilience. And so for this, we used Hall Nagel's model of resilience, including these four abilities of responding, monitoring, learning, and anticipating. Um, and we looked at this for the self. We asked our respondents to talk about this in terms of at the individual level, as well as for their primary team and on the primary project that they work on. So we use this project level to get an idea of socio-technical resilience. Um, and we also looked at attachment style, which you may have heard of and typically refers to um, the sort of style that individuals use in their interpersonal relations, but is also a measure of how people orient towards threat um, with avoidance, attachment avoidance, referring to orienting away from threat and attachment anxiety, reflecting an orientation towards threat. So in terms of resilience, um, we see pretty high and comparable levels of resilience um, at these different levels of individual versus team versus project, as well as these different abilities of responding, monitoring, learning, and anticipating. Um, but we do see that there is a significantly higher level of resilience um, at the project level relative to the team level, uh, and also a higher level of monitoring and learning relative to a significantly lower level of anticipating. We also saw once again that identifying more as an RSC led to greater resilience, and this was across levels and across abilities, um, as well as in the aggregate. And um, in terms of attachment style, we saw that uh, RSCs tended to be higher in attachment anxiety relative to attachment avoidance. So in other words, showed this uh, greater tendency to orient towards rather than away from threat. Um, and that identifying more as an RSC predicted a greater level of attachment anxiety. Um, we also found that greater attachment anxiety predicted greater resilience, again, across abilities, um, whereas greater attachment avoidance only predicted greater learning. And finally, we looked at um, some of these uh, mechanisms of how identifying more as an RSC led to more positive professional outcomes and found that uh, that relationship was mediated both by greater autonomy and by greater resilience, such that identifying more as an RSC predicted a greater degree of autonomy, a greater degree of resilience, and that each of these um, then in turn predicted more positive professional outcomes. So uh, just to review um, the findings that I have shared with you today, uh, we found that a majority of RSCs claim that RSC professional identity although nearly all also have an additional uh, disciplinary identity. We found that there is a high level of concern about both error reduction and de-skilling, as well as positive attitudes towards and a high use of automation, um, and that there is nonetheless still some uneasiness about automation's relationship with de-skilling. Um, we also found that high, RSEs have a high level of professional autonomy and that this is increased by adoption of the RSE identity. We found that RSEs also tend to have uh, fairly positive uh, professional outcomes, that this is increased by the adoption of the RSE identity, but that satisfaction um, is lagging behind a bit. Um, we also found that RSEs have a high level of resilience across the different levels that I mentioned um, and across resilience abilities as identified by Hall Nagel, and that all of these forms of resilience uh, at all levels are increased by adoption of the RSE identity uh, with the lowest ability being anticipation, uh, and that RSEs tend more towards anxious relative to avoidant attachment. Uh, in other words, that they're more likely to orient towards rather than away from potential threats and problems, um, and that this uh, tendency is increased by the adoption of the RSE identity, um, and that this orientation also tends to predict greater resilience. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you, any feedback, anything that you found uh, expected versus surprising, any context that you may have to offer, um, or other questions or ideas for future research. And 
So I also want to thank uh, my colleagues on the Stride team, uh, all of the RSEs who provided feedback, uh, and of course those who participated in the survey, and to all of you who are here today in the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. So I'm going to switch over to Slido because I've seen, if I can get the right one, you can leave your slides up there and we can put, attempt to put, there we go, Slido up on the board. So um, yep, yeah, lots of good questions coming in. I'm gonna be taking them from Slido until they're all gone before going to the audience. So head over to Slido, get up voting. The top one on there is strong autonomy seems to disagree with complaints we heard in the previous panel on RSEs being steamrolled by academics. Was there a widespread in the responses? So I'd, I'd have to look back to tell you exactly what the spread was. There, there didn't seem to be. I also um, was surprised by the, by the high level of, of response um, to, the, uh, to the autonomy question, including kind of across different forms of autonomy. Um, so yeah, if you have insight that you can provide on where that, what, where that gap might be coming from, I would love to hear that. One of the reasons we included autonomy is because we knew that it, it might be an issue. Um, I think that the, it wasn't significantly different. We did see that there was the lowest level was um, critical or strategic autonomy, meaning the goals that RSDs were able to choose for themselves and how they were being evaluated. So I think, um, you know, but, but that difference again was not significantly different. So. Um, something to look into in future. Great, thank you. Um, so the next one is more of a comment than a question, as is convention. Um, well, it's jumping around, but uh, I'm surprised that so many people, so few people with research software engineer as their job title, but many with just software engineer. Yes, um, that is interesting. I think that probably speaks to, and maybe this would be different uh, across countries. Again, we had many more respondents from the UK, but I wonder if that has something to do with uh, where the RSC identity is in terms of it being an emerging versus established identity, where at this point it's a way that people identify themselves, but maybe not the title that they're being hired under. Um, and we did, again, let people write in their own titles rather than providing them. So this is how people genuinely reported uh, being referred to in their contracts. Okay, so uh, next one, I'll stop there. So for someone with influence over culture in a team of RSCs, what are some of, the, some of the most important things I can do with this information to support my staff? So I think that uh, one thing is you can sort of rest assured that they are focusing on potential problems um, and that they don't need to be guided in that direction. But alternatively, that uh, anticipation is one area that uh, sort of they would benefit from support in. So um, not necessarily just being reactive to problems, but translating that ability to learn from the patterns to actually being able to anticipate future problems. Wonderful. And there's a, a, a survey process question here. So not sure if you said at the start, but how did you reach the respondents? What was your uh, process for that? Uh, you had a good spread across the demographics, it's noted. Thanks. Um, so I think for that, I have to thank uh, all of the, the RSE partners that the team worked with, some of whom I think are here today. Um, uh, so we, we reached out to different, so on the Stride grant, um, there are two of us who are psychologists, all the other members of the grant uh, are RSEs. And um, through them, we reached out to different RSE communities and got some exposure through uh, newsletters. And I think that's, that's you know, a really wonderful response through that. Great, wonderful. So, uh, did, uh, we also post you... on Slack. Yeah. That's always a good way yeah. to meet lots of people. Um, could you explain what resilience means in this context? Yeah, so um, we took a pretty traditional social psych approach to operationalizing resilience. So on the basis of those four abilities, uh, we wrote questions. It was two questions per ability and then um, answering those questions res with respect to all three of those individual uh, team and project levels and each of the questions had these two statement items for um, participants to respond to, to say the extent to which they agreed that they engaged in or were successful with each of the, these abilities. Okay, so a good open question here. What do you think should be investigated next, given these results we found? Interesting, so I, th I think that you all might give me a better answer to this than I have. Um, I think probably maybe that question of anticipation and how to improve uh, RSE's ability to anticipate, um, and maybe also how to kind of bring up that uh, team level of resilience would be interesting questions to explore, and also a, an interesting area where 
um, you know, that the RSC role uh, intersects with other, other roles on a research team. Okay, so the next one here is uh, moving from a, a regression to a categorical. How does this vary between academia and industry? Is there a decisive split between the two? Um, some of the responses obviously are going to be uh, strongly informed by that, but uh, what else do you think or did you see that split between academia and industry affecting? That's a great question. Um, I think I'm going to have to, maybe, maybe that's a good, my answer to that will be a good answer to the previous question and that'll be um, something I try to answer empirically by looking at how some of these results vary between our academic respondents and our industry-based respondents. Okay, uh, next one up here is RSE between R research and SE software engineering or engineer. Which part is more important? So I, I think, again, I'm, I'm not sure which part is more important. We do have some research in the works that um, is on all SEs and not RSEs specifically. So maybe by comparing some of the results, uh, we'll be able to get an idea of that. OK, well, we've got lots of questions. We've uh, I don't to keep you talking on and on and on. But um, <laughs> as long as they're getting up votes, um, I'll keep taking them. Um, so some engineers may see automation as a necessary evil, comment on the um, perhaps inverted expectation of what you were seeing mm -hmm. there, while some others might see it more positively because it gives them more time. Yeah, that does. it does seem to be um, kind of a, uh, a double-edged sword in most people's perception. Um, I also, we also find that it, it can mean different things to different people. So we took a pretty traditional social psych approach of just letting it, you know, naming it and letting people respond to it as they would, but it would be interesting to see if taking a more fine-grained approach to defining it brought out different, uh, different sides of attitudes that people have towards it. Uh, top one here is, I think, a response to one of the earlier comments on software engineer mm -hmm. versus research, research software engineer. Maybe it's a professional CV fodder, more recognized. Maybe that's something that interesting. Um, yeah. needs Thank to be turned you. around. Um, so I'll go to the next one, because there's a question mark at the end of it. So there's actually a question there. The stronger link to attachment anxiety is interesting. Could it help emphasize the importance of us discussing mental health in the workspace? Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that I'll, I'll be doing next probably is looking at um, whether that is whether that link was stronger for the RSC identity specifically relative to people's additional disciplinary identities because we would expect to see higher attachment anxiety associated with a higher level of social identification in general. Um, but I do think it speaks to um, some of the, the orientation towards the work um, and it would, be, it would be interesting. It was an, an unexpected finding to see that it actually predicted greater resilience um, and I am very curious to look further into how it might relate to issues of mental health. Okay, and this next one is another, I think, idea for future. So obviously this is looking at research software engineers, but it's asking about ideas for um, potentially looking at comparative studies against other research technical professionals, which I think is what that stands for. Interesting. Um, so we do have uh, another study that I mentioned before looking at um, different you know, people doing different types of digital, not research, but uh, different kinds of software engineering, computer science, et cetera. Um, so that's something we may be able to look at there. Okay, and there's someone here who's been listening to the FAIR comments earlier. Um, where's it gone? It's jumped around. Uh, have you released the raw anonymized data and considering doing at some point or publishing the results yet? Yes, um, we will be looking to publish the results and we'll also be aiming to make the uh, anonymized data available. Um, and allowing it to be open source. I think I'm gonna take one last question, which is here, how confident are you with the quality of work as this is a self-assessment? Right, so there is always an issue with self-report. Unfortunately, um, some of our other projects involve using um, discourse analysis methods where people have, you know, those self-report issues are, are less of an issue, um, but that is, I guess, it, it has the same level of, of quality as other, um, self-report data, but that is a perpetual limitation of that kind of data. Okay, so I'm gonna take that last question that's out there. How can one foster an identification as RSC community building or engagement as a conversation for lunchtime? Talk amongst yourselves. Grab Melanie if you want to ask her about it, but I'd like everyone to thank Melanie and Graham, our speaker, for last time.